bear with us for a few moments as we wait for the attendees to stream in into the main webinar room. All right, looks like it's slowing a bit. I'm sure more will still stream in over time, but um, let's get started. So welcome to this webinar session. It's the ninth session of our monthly webinar series called ETS for Policy Practitioners, which is hosted by the International Carbon Action Partnership with support from the European Commission. My name is Mike Meiling. I'm very pleased to be moderating today's session. Please note um, from the outset, the session is being recorded and it will be made available on the ICAP website as have been made available previous installments um, of this webinar series. Today's topic is oversight of carbon markets. Carbon markets, such as emissions trading systems are a bit different from many other environmental or climate policy instruments in that they create a market. And that raises its own set of, let's say policy challenges. You have markets, so you have trading and where there's trading going on, you have to think about who can trade, what is being traded, under what conditions. And early ETSs, early carbon markets did face some, um, let's say, unforeseen developments, some undesirable um, incidents um, related to still insufficient or not fully fledged out oversight. Um, and that's what we want to talk about today. What have we learned on oversight of carbon markets? How have we learned to adopt the right kind of policies and practices pract um, practices to ensure that this trading part, this market part of carbon markets does not lead to results that are undesirable or have unintended consequences. And to um, discuss this with us today, we have a stellar panel. I'll be introducing them very shortly, but let me still frame um, the, the session a little bit before we start. So we have 90 minutes for this topic. About 45 to 50 minutes will be introductory and discussant remarks. And then we'll open it up for questions and answers with you, with the participants. Um, and we'll try to reserve at least half an hour for that discussion. And um, when we proceed to this Q&A, you have various options. Um, you can enter questions in the Q&A and I'll ask them to the um, panelists, to our speakers and panelists afterwards. You can also raise your hand if you want, if you're set up with a microphone and camera and would like to ask it live, we of course welcome that. Um, and if you really choose, you can use the chat, although we prefer to keep that separate because we tend to communicate with the chat um, between the panelists if there's something like a question or so that we want to address to somebody specifically. So focus on the Q&A and um, the raise hands, but I'll get, I'll repeat that again when we get to the Q&A. But let's move on to our introductory uh, presentation and then our discussion remarks. So as I mentioned, a great panel to talk about oversight of carbon markets. Our kickoff presenter today is Regina Betz. She's a professor for energy and environmental economics. And she also heads the Center for Energy and Environment at the Zurich Hochschule für Angewandte Wissenschaft, so Zurich um, University of Applied Sciences in Zurich, Switzerland. She's an expert in the design and evaluation of policy instruments such as taxes, market-based approaches to climate change, air pollution, energy efficiency, and so forth. And anybody who's worked on the EU ETS and emissions trading more generally has been following her work probably for about 15 to 20 years. Certainly was some of my earliest reading on the ETS quite a while ago. Um, and then that will be followed. So her presentation will be followed by reactions from um, two representatives, one of public policy and one from the private sector. And again, offering, I think, really unique insights. The first will be Dino Tolian, who is a policy officer for emissions trading and economic issues at the European Commission at the Director General Climate Action, which manages and administers the European emissions trading system, um, the probably still largest emissions trading system in the world, although, of course, the Chinese national ETS is rivaling sort of that, that, um, that rank or that position, but of course it is the oldest and first international emissions trading system for um, greenhouse gas emissions. And then after dinner, we'll have Eduardo Piquero, an Argentinian, but living in Mexico, if I didn't get it wrong, who is director general at Mexico Dos or Mexico Two. Um, and he's an expert in greenhouse gases, um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction trading systems and international climate change policy. And just a word about Mexico Dos, which I'm sure he'll talk about a bit more. It's a trading platform set up in Mexico to facilitate 
trading um, of emissions allowances and credits. And this is really interesting because Mexico, as many of you know, is just in the process of now rolling out its emissions trading system and beginning to trade. So I'll start by asking Regina to provide her more conceptual, I think, overview and presenting some of her research, uh, current and past research on the topic of robust oversight of carbon markets. And Regina, you have a presentation as far as I know, you'll share the screen. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Michael. Just wondering, uh, the Mentimeter questions, are you doing them at the end or in the middle or now or? Good, good, good point, Regina. I think it makes sense to put them at the outset and Jan Erik has set them up. So if you, if you would care to um, put them in the chat, Jan Erik, the link. So what we would invite our participants is to click on the link that you see in the chat. Um, it's a Mentimeter link. It will take you to a survey. And we have put a few questions in there to better understand our audience, but also to sort of gauge your understanding of market oversight and some of the choices that have to be made to see what your preferences are, because that's something that I think Regina can then also pick up in her presentation and of course the discussions, and we can return to that in the question and answer. So all you have to do is on your browser or even on your phone, if you like, to um, click on the link that's currently in the chat. And Jan Eric has put the results already that are coming in live on the screen. So first we wanted to have a bit of a sense of the distribution of participants. Where do they come from? What sectors, what backgrounds? Primarily at least many of you might be working or have been working in different fields. It looks like sort of from the early trend we're seeing that a majority are in research and analysis, might be academia, think tanks, um, analysis, um, service providers. Then the second largest group, it seems, will be NGO and advocacy, probably places like you know, environmental NGOs, um, something like Carbon Market Watch or Environmental Defense Fund, potentially. But we do have some government and public administration representatives, one at least, um, then the compliance entity of emitting sector, and finally, some market intermediaries, which, which could be banks, brokers, exchanges, etc. Cool. Yeah, I think probably with 18 responses now, I think we can move on to the next one. And the next question um, relates to the nature of the units that are traded in the market. So this is one big question that has, has lots of implications for carbon market oversight and for the legal, in particular, the regulatory uh, framework that applies. So the question is, how would you classify that? I think it's a financial instrument more like a commodity such as electricity, for instance, or like a currency, something that central banks administer, or finally something new. very evenly distributed so far. Ah, a financial instrument is taking the lead. Some folks probably located in Europe and know how at least the EU has decided to categorize this, okay. Good. So I think with 18, again, we can probably move to the last slide. Thank you for the responses. And finally, a question that every ETS has to ask itself from the outset, ideally in some cases, only once trading has started is who should be allowed to trade? Who should uh, have access to this market and be able to purchase and sell, hold, et cetera, um, the units that are traded in this carbon market? Three options very limited, only compliance entities. One that's a bit broader, also allowing certain intermediaries to offer their sort of services, but also to benefit from the market. And finally, unrestricted, open to everybody. Essentially all of us, including individuals like myself, our panelists and the audience. Well, it seems like this last option has the most um, support. And we can also, I think, discuss a bit during the webinar, what the pros and cons, because each option has trade-offs. Um, and indeed, each of these options has also seen, let's say, um, implementation in practice. So different emissions trading systems have answered this question for themselves differently. Great, 20 answers, perfect. So I think this gets us off to sort of a little bit of a sense of who our audience is, and also that there's a heterogeneity of views on how one should um, implement market oversight. And now truly over to you, Regina, 
to take us through some of these conceptual issues and possible solutions. No worries. Thank you, Michael, again. And yeah, welcome everybody. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be invited to give you some of my insights on, on research on oversight of carbon markets. As um, Can you see my screen? Yes, it works well. Okay. Just very quickly, um, Michael already mentioned, I'm heading up the Center for Energy and the Environment at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And I just wanted to highlight that, so I'm not on my own, I've got um, a group of people um, and we mainly work on climate and energy issues. And these two projects, uh, the SNIS project and the DITS fellowship, I would like to highlight specifically because um, with the SNIS project, and Michael is part of that project, we're going to uh, publish um, a book which is looking at risks of carbon markets later on this year, most likely at the COP, we will launch it. And then in this um, digital fellowship, um, we are preparing a carbon market toolkit um, where we put a lot of data together. Some of the data I will present today, but we are it's like a two year project and in it's uh, just starting and that will also provide um, kind of a yeah, database where you can look at what happens in the international car markets. So with this, um, let me start with a quick claim. So, yeah, as Michael said, I'm now working for 20 years in this uh, topic. So for me, carbon markets are really designer markets. So they wouldn't exist if regulators wouldn't implement them. And uh, because they are artificial, I think there is really a need for regula uh, regulators to oversight them properly. And um, because the traded units are invisible, um, it's even harder to control these markets. And um, trust is important for every market and for this one specifically. Um, and that's why um, strong oversight is necessary. So just to, to tell you where I'm coming from and, and, and why I make, um, yeah, look, look at that topic. Now for many years, I've been um, looking at, at this topic of, of market risks and, and the need of oversight. And um, so, I have decided to target two different angles. So the first angle would be looking at the physical flows and the risks um, with regard to the environment. So this is more related to monitoring, reporting and verification and the risk of underreporting. So that will be my first focus area. Then I will look at market risks. This is most likely what you expect more when it, you know, when we talk about oversight over markets. So price manipulation, insider trading, then I'm not going to really go into detail on algorithm trading, but um, I think this is a topic we should at least come up um, with some discussion later on. Uh, and also allowance theft, I'm not going to talk too much about that, um, but I think it's one of the market risks as well. And then when you take markets into a more international context, if you have linked markets, things become even more complicated and oversight is even more important because then you have all these um, yeah, risks which happen when you have cross-border trading. So that will be um, my third focus area. And you see, so the first one is really looking at environmental flows. The two other ones are more looking at money flows. You know? So they don't have so much implications on, on, on the, the environment itself, more on who has money, who's winning, who's losing, et cetera. So coming to my first focus area, so environmental risks. And um, you know, it's, it's recently, so I think some of these um, news are just maybe last week or so, you know, that in even the Chinese ETS now, there is um, companies which have been uh, caught because they were not reporting the truth in their, um, about their, emissions we had in Switzerland and you know Swiss people are usually um, yeah thought of to be very very um, um, how you call that uh, you know good in, in, in high quality like Swiss quality but even here we had 600,000 tons of CO2 equivalents which were not reported by a chemical company called Lonza one which is actually um, manufacturing the corona 
um, uh, yeah, vaccination Moderna here in Switzerland. Um, and then, yeah, we had problems on the country level where um, HFC emissions were underreported. There is an article um, published in PNAs. And uh, we had recently also, there are some NGOs looking at leaking of methane emissions, for example, in Germany, which haven't been reported properly. So there is some issue with regard to most likely more underreporting than overreporting, I would say. And um, so when it comes to the process, which is very, you know, generally applied in, in almost all emissions trading schemes I'm aware of, um, we have usually a regulator. The regulator might also establish a body which is um, yeah, qualifying verifiers to be able to be verifiers in that particular um, carbon market. And um, then the verifier usually gets emission reports from the firm and it checks these reports and then submits the report to the regulator. And uh, then the, the regulator might be doing some spot checks himself. So um, what, what I think is a problem in such a setting is that the verifier is in most emissions trading markets uh, selected by the company as a polluting firm itself. So um, that gives a problem that there is a repeated interaction between the verifier and the firm. And so there might be, you know, even, you know, some long-term relationship where um, you could em envisage that um, the verifier uh, has an interest to not reveal if there is underreporting, and because there's also com competition among verifiers, this becomes even worse. And um, yeah, the random checks of uh, these regulators, they are also um, not always happening and not very transparent how often they happen. And that makes the situation, you know, less likely that there's a probability that this cheating is actually detected. And um, I used to live in Australia. There was a, a small emissions trading market called New South Wales GIGA scheme. They actually turned it around and there it was the, um, the regulator who received the money from the companies to appoint verifiers. And the verifiers were then basically, um, you know, the client was the regulator and not the firm itself. So there are small things where you could change uh, the incentives. And, um, there is, oh, sorry, there is um, some research and uh, I was part of that research where we uh, were testing different rotation methods in the laboratory. So that was an experiment we were running and we were in one setting. So in this first one, we were completely uh, rotating the verifier and the regulator. In this uh, second treatment, we were only rot uh, rotating the verifier. And in the third one, it was only um, the official uh, who was um, kind of ro rotated. That means there was an uncertainty. Who are you going to get for your verification? And what you can see here, so this is the frequency of true fall reporting. So the baseline is without any rotation where the firm can choose their own verifier. And you can see over time that um, the situation in the complete rotation leads actually to more truthful reporting. And um, we also see that, um, that the officials are usually, when they have been checking more often, that then there is also um, a higher degree of truthful reporting. So the, the probability of being checked and the real checking also improves um, the truthfulness of reporting. And what we also found is that it's quite difficult to have an incentive for officials to, um, yeah, to check because yeah, you, you might need to have some reward systems even for, for the officials because um, in that setting, they were basically not really incentivized to do anything special. 
So this is my first focus area. So that was more on the environment and the problems which could arise there with reporting and that oversight of the regulator uh, on the verifier, selecting them, rotating them, could improve the situation. Now let's go to more the um, situation where we look at the markets and the money flows in those markets. So when we look at different markets, so this is um, the Korean market is this uh, light uh, green one. The EU ETS price um, is the dark blue one. Uh, we've got the California, which is, which is this one, the, the orange one. And then we have some uh, Chinese pilot schemes and all is in euros per uh, ton of CO2. And what you see is that, for example, the Californian market had a very, very, you know, small fluctuation around the 15 euro. And the uh, reason for this is that it was mainly staying at the floor price. So there was a floor price and um, there was rarely any, um, yeah, it was almost all the time at that pr uh, price level. So um, you can see that market ma manipulation and market you know, volatility can be reduced if you have some um, yeah, price floors and, and, and caps in ETS scheme. Then when we look at the Korean one, what we see is that we always had a peak when they were handing in allowances. And we see that there was some increase just, um, you know, 2019, 20. And they also did some changes then to the, the, the rules of the scheme. And then you, you see um, there were impacts there. And in the European one, we had similar things. We had a market stability reserve, which was announced. And when it actually was announced that it's going to reduce the amount of available allowances, it actually really was driving the price even further up. So you can see that uh, the prices are moved by many things, but also by political decisions. And um, yeah, for understanding if there's any price manipulation, it's, it's hard because there are so many factors influencing the price. So it's, I mean, the weather, it's uh, how the fossil fuel prices are um, yeah, changing the relationship. Think about gas versus coal and so on. So, so it's, it's difficult um, to really look at market risks and, and if there has been uh, yeah, any influence um, just by looking at the price. But what would be a reason for um, influencing the, the market price, like the carbon price? And um, there has been some theoretical literature which shows that there are dominant firms that might actually have an incentive to manipulate the permit price and to, to increase them, specifically if they are dominant in both markets, in their own product market. Let's think of electricity companies selling electricity. Um, and if they got free allocation up to a certain level and they can pass on the costs, then they might really benefit from higher CO2 prices and they might want to get the price going up. There has been some um, yeah, empirical research on that. You can see here, these are the five biggest uh, players um, of electricity companies in the EU. ETS, and you can see that especially RWE, I think, which is the biggest one, I think 7% or so of all the allowances are um, were allocated to RWE. And you can see that they were holding allowance surpluses. That means beyond what they really needed. So they were trading beyond compliance. And I mean, th that might be a strategy. It's a bit weird in this early years because there was no banking possible. I mean, that strategy later on makes more sense because you can take the allowances with you. Here, there was basically the end of um, yeah, banking at the end of 2007. And you can see still they were kind of increasing their bank a lot. So there is the question. Um, but this example already gives you an in, yeah, the feeling that you know, they might have had a different strategy. It's very difficult to actually um, yeah, sue anybody um, based on, on that data because it's not forbidden. 
to buy more allowances. So what is maybe a, another angle to look at it, not only looking at the price and how much uh, they are um, buying beyond compliance, but just to look at who's really in the market. So oversight um, by looking at market participants. And so this is work which I also did on the EU ETS. Um, it, it's also on the first phase. And this is a cluster analysis um, where we clustered according to specific um, trading patterns, I would call it. So we have um, those who are not trading a lot or almost just maybe once. And they will, these are the majority, as you can see, the passive ones are more than 7,212 accounts. So this is an account level. And these are a lot, so these are the operational holding account. That means these are the regulated entities. And you see the majority of them is really passive. And they come from energy and industry and some others. Then when we look at the more active ones, the, the most active one is actually this one. Uh, this is the London Clearing House, which was the, the clearing house for the forward future market, like the future market. So um, this is a kind of a unique uh, pattern. And so it, it didn't classify in any of the other ones. But then we have also some other highly active or continuous trading ones. And you can see these are just very few accounts. So we have five, which are really continuous trading. They come from the energy sector. We have um, seven, which are highly active. And most of them, if they are others, they come from the financial sector. So that's what we found out. And if you look at these passive ones and the active ones down here, you see that here the dominant color is actually these different red types. And that means these are all non-regulated entities. Uh, and just in the acquiring one, these are the ones which have been short as well. They are some of the regulated entities. So this gives you a hint that um, most of the um, entities, at least in the early days, so this is really 2005 up to 2008, um, have been passive and there were the most active ones might more be uh, non-regulated entities um, coming also from the financial sector. That's why we also did another study where we looked at the role of banks, specifically banks in the, in the EU ETS, so this is data from 2005 to 2014. So it goes a bit um, beyond the data I showed you before. You can see here the price crash. And then uh, you know, we see that the price started again at a higher level. So here on that side, you see euros per ton of CO2. And uh, here you can see um, the millions of EUAs which have been transferred by either where the banks were buying the banks were selling. And um, so this here shows you the total um, transactions, buying and selling in the market. And so what is yeah, very um, visible from the very beginning that it's always in T3. So at the end of the year, banks become very active. And the reason for that is that they were usually hedging partners and they were uh, fulfilling their contracts. So this is data from the registry, so from the EU ETL. That means these are really a spot transaction. There's no forward market. But the forward market is, um, yeah, you can see it's reflected in the situation where, where the futures and forwards become mature and are actually exchanged. And that is usually at the end um, at the of the year, so in T3, and you can see always that there is this um, higher uh, numbers of uh, bank uh, transactions um, at, uh, at that time of the year. And you can also see that it's usually very similar buying and selling. So they might be, um, you know, working as an intermediary a lot, you know, buying and selling um, and, and, and doing brokerage. 
they are, as I said before, also, the, you know, this market is special because in other markets, you have hedging partners, which are also, you know, if I'm um, an oil company and I'm selling my oil to um, some um, refinery, then we both have an interest to come up with, um, you know, having, having forwards or futures to um, reduce the risk of, of price movements. However, in this market, the counterpart is actually missing because the, you, you, you only have these buyers in the market. And so the banks are fulfilling that role of the other side. So they are really the counterparty of hedging. But they also played another role. And this is now actually based on uh, interviews. So that was data. Uh, we were watching data. Then we were looking who are the active ones. And then we were interviewing these people. And so they also played um, the role of, as an aggregator. So they were aggregating uh, allowances from, um, from smaller companies. And in order to lower the transaction cost, they were kind of selling them for them. We also have banks which were market makers. So market makers are those providing liquidity. We also some energy companies were market makers. Um, and they usually kind of uh, put bits and offers with a, a spread of like five cents or so in the market. And uh, they usually get some discount from the exchange. They are working as a market maker then to, to be part of it. Um, we also found out that they um, yeah, are speculating and are also um, providing arbit arbitrage um, services so that there are no price spreads between different markets. Um, they are also uh, service providers. So they, um, yeah, there were some um, stories that they are borrowing the permits and then they are surrendering them with a certain interest rate. Um, and so the clients actually get more liquid. So they get money up to the date where they have to surrender them. Um, and we also know that they have been publishing uh, newsletters and so on. So they are also market analysts. And that is... You know, I put that insider trading. So they are trading at the same time and they're providing information. So there might be some um, yeah, conflict of interest there as well. Now, this is now moving to my third angle. Now, we've been in the market, but we were more looking in, you know, that could be just one national market. Now, um, I'm actually missing. One slide, sorry, yeah. This slide is, um, oh no, it's coming there, sorry. Um, so we are now looking at the more complex than the markets when they are linked. And when I'm talking about linking, I also talk about, uh, or I mean markets which are linked, for example, via the Kyoto mechanism. So we had um, the clean development mechanism and joint implementation on the international level. And as you can see here with these red um, arrows, they were linked to some of the other more regional or national uh, or subnational schemes. And so, um, as you can see here, um, CDM and jo joint implementation. So the units which were traded are called the certified emission reductions and the emission reduction units, they were also uh, possible to be surrendered in the emissions trading system in, in the European Union, or in the Swiss system or in the New Zealand one. And because these markets um, use the same currency, they are linked indirectly, although they might not be directly linked, there is an impact from one to the other. So that makes things more complicated, because then you have the borders and um, yeah, that, um, let me show you what, what we did. Um, so that is um, one problem, what we had in the European um, yeah, EU ETS, and that was VAT fraud. So well, you added tax fraud. And um, you know, there have been already some, um, yeah, um, the courts have been, um, yeah, um, call, um, how you call that, uh, 
putting people into jail and so on. Um, and, and, and we know quite a bit about this uh, VAT fraud. There was, I think, Interpol, Europol, and so on. They have been all uh, publishing things on that. And what we know when we look at the data, what I find interesting is that exactly during the time where the VAT fraud was at the peak, you can see that there was a huge increase in the number of transactions. When you look here at that, um, the total transfer volume, it also shows that it increased substantially between 2008 to 2009. But we also see that, for example, at the end of the compliance period, it increased a lot. So there is not, it's not as um, eye catching as when you look at the number of transactions. And so um, this particular problem of VAT fraud, um, which um, actually moved from one country, so it started in France, went to the UK, and then uh, came to, to Germany. Um, and then there was actually, um, yeah, something from the police happening uh, that at the end in 2010, it, it, it really um, disappeared. And, and the country started to change the way the VAT was applied, either by um, doing it, um, by exempting um, the EUAs from VAT totally, or applying a reverse charge um, system. But what we also saw is that, um, you know, these VAT fraud, uh, you know, came also because um, there were accounts from companies which had their um, origin in Hong Kong or United Arab Emirates, uh, Switzerland <laughs> and Singapore. And what we also learned is that if you have in your linked market one country where there is a yeah, less rigorous um, assessment when opening an account, you can, you, you can have problems for the whole market. So here uh, there is uh, anecdotal evidence that Denmark was even allowing dead people to allow to open accounts. And so, um, yeah, Denmark really um, had, had problems in that, but things have changed and I'm sure Dino will tell you what they have been implementing afterwards to kind of ensure that this is not happening anymore. Um, another way of looking at the data for oversight is looking at really the transactions of just one single. So this is one single JI project number where we have been looking who has been involved in holding them uh, issuing them and at, at the end um, kind of um, surrendering them. And what you can see here is so they started with the, U, um, the Ukraine and then um, the different colors, I mean, it's very small and I don't, you, you don't need to, to kind of really look at the details, but what I want to show is that, so this is where they kind of came in. Then we had some um, very light blue ones. These are the regulated companies. They are usually not the ones at the very beginning. You see they have been first sending it to green accounts, which are those which are more PHA, like personal holding accounts or trading accounts. And then, um, you know, they were trading many times until at the end, they ended up in some countries in the country account, the party account, basically. And just what I want to show you is that it's not very easy to kind of follow these transactions. And that this idea, what, like I remember when um, joint implementation was negotiated, we thought, you know, there is one country implementing a project in another country, and then they receive these issued or transferred AAUs in ERUs, and then they use them for compliance nothing like this. This one changes the hands many times before it really is surrounded at the end. So and now let's move one level up. So this was one specific project and the issued ERUs of that project. This is now the, all, the whole market of um, joint implementation um, from the beginning to the, the end. We are now at the end of joint implementation. 
Um, and what you see here is the country level. And we did a network analysis where the different colors show you the different sectors which are involved. And again, what we find is that blue is the financial and insurance. They were also quite active in the joint implementation market. You see that um, the Euro Ukraine was really one of the major suppliers in the market. And then we had yeah, Great Britain, Hungary, um, we had um, some German accounts as well. Um, and Switzerland also is, is, is quite uh, an important player in the JI market. But what we found when we did some um, correlations and we looked at different centrality measures in that network, and especially this between this uh, centrality measure, we found out that these Jersey uh, counts actually um, are, yeah, really some outliers. So these channel islands are um, having a very high um, between the centrality and uh, that shows that they are most likely kind of a broker or intermediary in this, this market, which I didn't know before. But if you are looking at the data, the blue and the orange uh, relate to if it's the first or the second commitment period. So that's the difference between um, the two. And blue is the first and uh, orange the second commitment period. And so in these two um, indicators, we see that uh, channel islands like Jersey, these accounts here, uh, seem to play a specific role, which is highlighted. So coming to my final thoughts, um, and I know I'm maybe already a bit over time. So markets can be made more robust, and this is now more to, related to the physical flows um, if we reduce the conflict of interest, you know, just having some rotation um, and, and spot checking and most likely even, you know, knowing the probability that you are spot checked will help. Um, again, theft, IT security is important. And um, when we look at markets, I think it's very important to have the data that everybody can access data. If it's with a, some lag, okay, but at least you know that builds trust. If we can see that that the data is there, uh, it's important that those doing the oversight have adequate staffing and also the skills. You can see it's huge amounts of data. You need to apply specific um, tools to, to to understand it. Um, but you also need a mandate to be able to intervene if you find something out, and. Um, yeah, coordination if you have different. So for us to bring together that data on joint implementation was, was quite a lot of work. We had to link the Swiss registry, the EU ET, ETL data. We had data from New Zealand, from the Ukraine, Russia, and so on in order to get the, the full picture. Um, and then data analysis, um, yeah, looking at uh, volatility, uh, who is trading? As I showed you, this is really the question. Who do you allow to be part of the market? Um, do you allow everybody, even you know, outside of your country to open accounts? Every sector to be in, involved? What will be the rules that they can open an account and, and, and play a role there? Um, look at the development of the volumes. I showed you that they might already tell you something. Also, the holding time of allowances might give you some idea of what's happening. And then this beyond compliance trading. Um, and the, the methods we use are cluster analysis, network analysis, and we also do some machine learning. So we are training algorithms with, for example, if we know that this is a specific fraud pattern, that they can then go through the data and uh, yeah, detect further fraud. So thank you very much. And uh, as I mentioned, there will be a, a book forthcoming under this NIST project um, where we talk about carbon market risks. Thanks so much, Martina. Um, I think this was an excellent sort of, um, well, you launched us into the topic, highlighting many of the challenges of carbon market oversight and some of the fascinating patterns that um, you can reveal with certain methods. Um, and as I said, it's more of a conceptual sort of overview and now we shift to, I, there have been a few questions already in the Q&A. 
and we will get to those. Um, Regina, if you want, you can already have a look at them. I think if there's really pure clarification questions, feel free to answer them in written because I want to make sure we have time for the sort of more discussion-like questions later. But right now I want to move on to Dino so that we do reserve adequate time for each of our two respondents. Um, and Dino does actually also have a presentation on how the EU has in fact responded to some of these issues in practice. Dino, please, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Regina, also for the presentation. Um, I will just share my screen. I hope you can see it now. This? Okay. Yes, so, looks good. Yeah. So, um, after Regina gave a more conceptual view on, of the market, I would give a bit more specifics on what we do in Europe. So um, on the EU emissions trading system uh, market. Here from the beginning, I would maybe make a distinction. So when we talk about the emissions trading system itself, it is um, policy that is developed by the EU. It is our uh, flagship policy to combat climate change. Um, and the market the, that we talk about, the European carbon market, is something that was developed as a consequence of this policy, and it is supporting the achievement of the goals of the policy. So on one hand, the basic facts about the, the policy system we are talking about for the international audience who maybe don't know, um, the EU ETS is a cap and trade system that applies to approximately 10,000 installations in the power generation and industry sector, but also to the emissions from uh, aviation activities within uh, the countries, so the territory that is part of the EU ETS. When I talk about territory, it is because it, um, the geographical scope is wider than just the EU. We have the 27 EU member states, but we also have Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein that are part of the EU ETS. And, um, Regina is from Switzerland, uh, so we also have a linking agreement with, uh, with the Swiss ETS. The EU ETS is currently covering around 40% of the EU emissions. As all cap and trade systems, it functions on the principle that you establish a cap for the overall number of emissions that can be emitted. Within that cap, the, the participants in the system can trade in order to um, achieve the abatement of emissions in a way that is um, most cost effective. And the allowances are put on the market either through auctions, which is the default method of putting allowances to the market, or free allocation, which is being gradually reduced and it's granted only to the industry. Um, when we talk about the carbon market, as I said, that is supporting the policy, it has changed drastically uh, since it started in 2005. So uh, the situation really, really changed in comparison to maybe um, some of the examples that Regina gave. Uh, the, first of all, the market has uh, grown substantially. Uh, the European Securities and Markets Authority, which is an um, authority that is uh, coordinating the work of national financial authorities in the EU, publishes the estimates where they estimate the size of different European markets, uh, carbon market being one of them. And here you can see um, the, the estimates of, of the previous three years uh, from 2018 to 2020. As you can see, the value of the market has increased significantly, more than 50% uh, in comparison to 2018. Uh, when I talk about the size of the market, I mean the value of transactions that are conducted in the market. So the, this, uh, these numbers are in billions of euros. So it's uh, 687 billion euros that we are talking about in 2020. Um, the reason why the value is increasing is because also the price is increasing, as you have heard. Um, the price is increasing for several reasons, but the most important ones is because we are reducing the scarcity of allowances in the market due to the functioning of the so-called market stability reserve on one hand, but also the increased ambition that the EU is announcing now in the frame of the Green Deal. 
What you also can see uh, from this table um, and can be interesting is that the majority of the market is situated on exchanges, so trading venues, and that the majority of market is in derivative contracts. Which brings us to the next slide, uh, where we can conclude that the emission allowances can be traded either through spot contracts, which are contracts where the delivery takes place almost instantaneously, or derivatives, which is much more often. And there are different types of derivatives. Regina already hinted that the prevailing type are the futures or the forwards. We even have the benchmark future contract, which is the, the December future contract. What does it mean? Uh, the derivative contract gives the, um, the parties certain flexibility when it comes to the delivery of allowances. So the delivery can be either subject to certain conditions or it can be uh, postponed in time. So in case of futures, two parties decide that they will lock in a certain price of allowances and these allowances will be delivered at the future point in time, in this case of a benchmark December future in the December of that year. Uh, other types of the derivatives that we can also find in the market are but much less than, uh, than futures are options, swaps, spreads, etc. What I would like to point out is that um, these different financial products were developed gradually and they were developed by the market. So it was the market that started packaging uh, emission allowances in these different types of products, uh, namely derivatives. Why? Because as I mentioned, derivatives gives us, give a certain flexibility to, to the ETS operators. Um, you have to bear in mind that a lot of these entities are, for example, power generation companies that want to plan their expenses for a longer period of time. So if they can lock in the price and know exactly how much they will pay at, and, and how many allowances they will get at a certain period of time, this is very good for their balance sheet. They, can, they have more stability in the system. And that brings us to the second point that usually the counterpart in these transactions and Regina also already hinted are financial entities. So the financial entities are the one who are ready to take the risk of the price at the current moment to buy allowances, but to deliver them only afterwards to, uh, to compliance entities at the time that is convenient for them. This is why uh, financial entities do have a very positive and I would say even key role in the market. When we are talking about the concentration of the market, um, market uh, in emission allowances is still quite new and as every new market, it is quite concentrated. So currently it is mainly concentrated on two trading venues. On one hand, we have ICE index in the Netherlands and the European Energy Exchange in Leipzig, Germany. So ICE index Netherlands um, is actually a subsidiary of, of um, ICE Futures Europe, which was based in, which is still based in London. But recently there was a move of uh, the trading from um, London to, to the Netherlands, which means that now um, the entirety of the market is uh, back in, in Europe because you know that uh, the UK unfortunately left um, uh, the, the union. So uh, when it comes to, to the repartition of the market shares, ICE has a dominant role that, uh, that cannot be disputed. On the second place uh, is EEX, and there's only a handful of other trading venues that uh, are also offering emission allowances, such as NASDAQ, some of the organized uh, trading facilities, etc. cetera. Um, when it comes to the supply in the market, so how are these allowances placed on the market? They are first placed on the market either through auctioning or free allocation. And these two ways of placing on the market is called also the primary market, as opposed to all the subsequent transactions that are part of the secondary market. Um, also, as opposed to what we saw uh, that is happening in the secondary market where ICE has a dominant role, on the primary market, the situation is that EEX has the dominant role. So, um, 
they won the, the contract for providing the services of the auction platform. And all the auctions are performed in Germany on EEX. Auctions are very, um, they are organized very often every business day. We have 3 million allowances injected in the market at every auction. So really the, the allowances keep flowing to the market on, on a constant, constant basis. And the auction revenues are distributed to the member states that are um, con considered to be the issuers of these allowances. As you can see, it's, the revenue is really impressive. Uh, so um, since the start of auction in 2012, uh, the member states have collected 57 billion uh, euros uh, on the basis of auctions. Uh, to be noted that also this money has to be used for climate related purposes, which is an, another uh, fact in the discussion, um, whether uh, cap and trade systems are good for, for climate. You can see that actually they provide a lot of um, revenues that can be used for, for these purposes. Um, on the other hand, the demand, so who is buying these allowances? Again, we, we can make a distinction between the auctions, the primary market and the secondary market. In the auctions, we have um, quite a, a list of companies uh, or entities that can participate, mostly, of course, compliance buyers, so buyers who have obligations, surrendering obligations under the ETS. They can form uh, certain business groupings. And then on the other hand, we have investment firms and credit institutions, which we have to point out have to be author, uh, authorized under their applicable uh, legislation. Uh, finally, there's also a possibility that the member states appoint some other entities to participate in the auction that would have to get a specific authorization but this is not case uh, in practice for the time being. When it comes to the secondary market, um, again, we have the same types of entities that are dominant. So uh, compliance buyers first and foremost, and then investment firms and credit institutions. What I would like to point out is that in order to take the so-called physical possession of allowances so that you can actually hold a physical spot allowance, you need to have an account in the union registry of emission allowances. So the registry is an electronic system that uh, registers all the transfers and allowances, uh, all the entities that uh, acquire allowances and hold them on their accounts. And uh, it is not possible to, to as I said, uh, gain ownership of an allowance without having this account, which is subject to specific rules, which we can touch on later on. The value of the market and the importance of the ETS as a policy for, for combating climate change really um, emphasize why it is important to have um, a robust market oversight framework for both the primary market and the secondary market. Uh, initially, the rules we had only concerned the auctions, the primary market and the secondary trading in derivatives since I mentioned derivatives were uh, financial products from the start. But this was improved in 2018, where uh, spot emission allowances were also classified as financial instruments in the Directive on Markets and Financial Instruments, or how it is popularly called uh, MIFID II. Uh, why is this important? Because this classification actually meant that the number of financial market rules now also apply to the carbon market. Um, which are the most important rules that apply? Uh, there are three of them. So uh, the mentioned MIFID, MIFI regime, the market abuse regulation and the anti-money laundering directive. Um, when it comes to the MIFID and MIFIR, the most important things that uh, you can find there is that establishes um, requirements for granting licenses to um, trading venues and financial intermediaries. Um, just a moment. On the other hand, we have very strict reporting and transparency requirements, which are there uh, first and foremost to avoid market abuse. And of course, the rules on supervision and cooperation between national competent authorities, because as we mentioned, 
uh, uh, most of the transactions in emission allowances are cross-border. So it is essential to have this uh, cooperation between um, different authorities. For the market abuse regulation, um, it regulates three types of market abuse insider dealing, so dealing on the basis of information that is not publicly available, the unlawful disclosure of inside information and market manipulation, which is interesting because market manipulation also means uh, practices where you try to change the price by spreading rumors or false information. And uh, also what we have to know that the market abuse regulation applies to everyone, to all market participants, and the geographical scope is very wide. So it, it applies also to cases of, of abuse that happen in a third country, not just the EU. Finally, we have the anti-money laundering directive, which establishes safeguards against uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, how does it work in practice? So we said to make a distinction between auctions, primary market, and the secondary market. Auctions um, are held on, on an almost daily basis, as I already mentioned, which means that you constantly have an inflow of, of allowances in the market. And it is very difficult for a company to, to get a dominant position in the market because there's, as I said, always fresh allowances coming. The auctions are designed in a way that um, the, the price in an auction has to be aligned with the secondary market price which prevents that there is uh, arbitrage between the two markets. Also, uh, you cannot see the bids that other participants are submitting. And there's only one single price at the end of the auction. We mentioned already the trustworthy categories of bidders that can be admitted to the auctions. There is uh, overall transparency because all the, um, auction, uh, all the auction volumes, all the results of the auctions, all the dates of the auctions are publicly available in so-called uh, auction calendars, so everybody can plan in advance um, when do they want to participate in the auctions and how much allowances they could buy. And finally, we have the reporting system that closely mirrors the, the situation we have in the secondary market, where the older transactions have to be reported to the financial authorities. In the secondary market, um, so we are talking about the same type of authorities, these financial authorities of 27 EU member states that are coordinated by the European regulator ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority. Um, how do they get information about the market? So first of all, we have uh, reporting and transparency requirements for trading venues and investment firms. They have to report all the transactions they enter into both the uh, transactions that are conducted on venue and the ones that are conducted over the counter, so-called OTC transactions. At the same time, um, they have to report the positions of all the um, uh, entities that in case of trading venues, uh, trade on, on the venue. And this position and emission allowances has to be reported on a daily basis to the competent authority but then on a weekly basis, this information is aggregated and publicly available for everyone to see on ESMA web pages. And finally, market participants themselves, they're obliged to report any kind of suspicious orders and transactions uh, to their authorities. So you can see that the authorities can act both ex officio or um, uh, at, at the report, uh, to react directly to the reports by market participants. Um, here you can see a diagram how it looks like. So in the center of the system, we have the platform or a, a trading venue, which first of all and foremost has to get a license. Even after it gets a license, it is constantly supervised by the supervisory authorities. It has transaction reporting uh, obligations and it has to report any suspicious transactions to the market abuse authorities. The counterpart for anti-money laundering cases are the financial intelligence units. So you can look at them as two sides of the coin. And finally, uh, here at the upper left part, you can see the logo of the commission institutions 
of the EU institutions, including the Commission. So um, what does the Commission do? Commission, first and foremost, has a supportive role. So we are the ones coordinating between different authorities, providing information if necessary, raising awareness about the market. But it is very important to note that the Commission doesn't have uh, the power to do market oversight because the prerogatives for this lie with the competent authorities in the member states. So we can raise awareness and we can, of course, coordinate, but uh, we are not the ones that are doing the bulk of the work. Um, now, just to maybe reflect a bit on some of the cases mentioned by Regina in her presentations. Our market is quite young, but still it is 16, 16 years behind us. Um, as Michael also mentioned in the beginning, we are maybe, I'm not sure we are maybe not the largest um, cap and trade system anymore, but we are definitely the first major one. So a lot of the things were also done uh, uh, by doing them. So it was learning by doing. Uh, there were some gaps over time, of course, but they have also been addressed. So when we talked about VAT carousel frauds, we are talking about cases that happened 10 years ago. Um, and we are talking about cases uh, mostly in the spot market, which is, as you remember from the presentation, was previously not regulated. The bad carousel fraud cases are now um, result with, with the so-called VAT reverse charge mechanism, where actually the burden of paying the uh, VAT is not anymore on the seller, but on the buyer of, of the service because you know that uh, by uh, selling emission and transferring emission allowances is considered a service under the VAT re, um, directive. Um, the cases of theft or cyber attacks also happened 10 years ago when we still had a system of national registries. Now all the registries have been in a way um, aggregated in a single union registry on the basis of the union with a much more reliable uh, IT system, uh, which can be compared even to a system of banks. So the accounts in the registry are similar to bank accounts. And finally, um, probably, you know, we had this big surplus in, in, the, in the European market, which was often due because of the, the inflow of, of international credits. In phase four, the, the current phase of the ETS international credits are no longer eligible for use. So this uh, also addressed some of the problems we had with the surplus in the market. Um, I would conclude by saying that since 2018, all trading in emission allowances, so both in spot contracts and derivatives, both on the auctions market and secondary market is subject to the same regime applicable to financial markets. So the same strict, robust rules that apply for, for example, shares, bonds, apply also to the emission market. Uh, for the end, some useful links. Uh, if you want more information, we have an annual report uh, to the parliament and the uh, council, so-called carbon market report, which you can find on our web pages. Also, there is a special section on market oversight um, on the pages of DG Klima. And to conclude, uh, our market, of course, is not a financial market. It is also an environmental market. So the most important uh, legislative acts that regulate the market are here the ETS directive, the auction regulation, and the registry regulation. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Dino. Again, for very clear and very rich presentation. We're behind time, of course, on the one hand, but I think that the content that both Regina and Dino have provided was, was worth that, um, eating a bit into our Q&A time. Um, Eduardo has already in the chat promised he's, he's going to stick to 10 minutes or less um, with some reactions on a perspective from one of the younger markets. And I've just put in the chat um, also a reminder, like for instance, I saw that one of our attendees had her hand raised before. Um, please feel free to continue doing so and entering questions and we'll get to as many as we can once we get into Q&A after Eduardo's remarks. So thank you, Eduardo, it's yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much for, for the, the invitation. I'm truly thankful for that and uh, being invited by 
the Mick Jagger and John Lennon of, of, of Cup and Trade. So it's wonderful to be here and regards from cloudy Mexico City. I'm Eduardo Piquero, I work for Mexico CO2. Mexico CO2 is a, a trading platform, of course, based in Mexico. Uh, we started working in 2013, of course, in the voluntary carbon market, then pre-compliance, and now under the Mexican ETS already enforced. Um, then we carried out a carbon market simulation back in 2017, 18. I'm very happy to see that Carolina Rodriguez, the winner of that simulation, is connected from from Mexico. So very glad to be to be to to be joined by her. Uh, we've also worked in, in other Mexican states, in Colombia, Chile, in Peru, in the Dominican Republic nowadays, and uh, in Jalisco, Jalisco, the, the newest, youngest uh, carbon pricing mechanism in Mexico. So m many things going on here. I, 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 I have just some, 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 some uh, um, insights from the trading perspective. Um, being nested again at the Mex Mexican Stock Exchange has provided us with, with a sensibility of how to provide certainty and, and how to structure uh, um, uh, trades that are, that are truly um, um, important for the market. The, the key word for all transactions, for all transactions, it doesn't matter if you are at exchange or at a, your convenience market, is always trust. If there is no trust in the transaction, there is no transaction, there will be no, no market. So um, how to build that, that transaction has two different perspectives. Number one, the quality of the thing you are buying that reflects on many of the, of the topics uh, that Regina pointed out and the that the transaction is completed efficiently. Those, those two different aspects provide what a transaction should 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 comply with to 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 help bring the market with 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 with, with the health. Um, nowadays, problem we have is that for for a cap and trade system for an ETS, we have these two different aspects too. But not only uh, we do have to provide efficiency and an effectiveness to the transaction, but also to provide environmental environmentally good, right? Uh, right? It's uh, they need to be environmentally sound. That has to do with with the with the quality of the thing we are we're buying or selling. The big problem that we have is that in Latin America and in all new markets, we are providing the task to build a new market to the environmental authority. So that means that an authority has no experience building markets. Now has a task to develop absolutely everything with a very very short and limited uh, um, amount of resources to do so. So that provides perhaps the youngest market to, 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 with a different task. And, and, and there is a lot to learn to, to what Dino uh, um, explained on, on how the ET, how the UETS combined both authorities, the financial authority with the, the environmental authority to, to, to provide effectiveness to the market. So, um, the answers to 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 to, to this um, uh, endeavor, to this task, are, are very difficult. But, but they need a formidable amount and of of time, of effort, and commitment. Of course, there is a lot of capacity building. We still need to 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 go through in Latin America specifically, and on all on all developing economies. Uh, in terms of how to build a market and how to build a, a, an ETS and, and to buy, provide it with the sufficient amount of, uh, of market oversight that is, that is needed. Um, of course, resources. It, it needs to be, to be uh, pointed out that most of our markets were developed or are developed under the PMR. Now the PMR has changed but we need more national commitment. We need more national resources generally attached to, to, to the development and operation of, 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 of all ETS in, in, in the regional elsewhere and technological solutions. There is something else that is going on. We are under a, an enormous technological uh, uh, revolution. One of the things that is definitely coming is blockchain. How are we going to integrate blockchain to our market oversight? That's a very difficult question, to be honest. So um, 
all in all, uh, my takeout to, for, for those new, new markets that are thinking or already developing ETS, um, such as Pakistan or Indonesia or Philippines or Saudi Arabia or any other large emitter, which is also an emerging economy, is there, there, there are many things that we could still drag from, from what of our, of our existing economies and, and build from there. Number one is the existing and very important large amount of market infrastructure that we can uh, still use. I'm thinking about clearing houses. That's something extremely difficult to build in, 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 in our region specifically. That's something that we could use from, from, from our financial markets. Registries, of course, so something that has to do with registries and auction mechanisms, something that could also be, be, be of many use, and of course, trading platforms. But the, the big, uh, um, my big takeout from this conversation is coordination between financial and environmental authorities. If they don't work together in market oversight, there is not much we, we can do. And the other, the, the other thing that, 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 that I would also point out is um, we need to review uh, every now and then, one, for, for instance, every, uh, uh, every time a phase ends, we need to review how our, how our markets have worked and the amount of transparency that we are providing to, 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 to a market. There will, need, there will be a, a growing desire and, 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 uh, and, and a need for companies and for the general market, for general public to access data and information and everything is transparent nowadays. If something goes wrong with our ETS, with our cap and trade system, that would definitely harm uh, the, the, the trust in our system. Therefore, transparency is a key word for, for the success of all cap and trade systems worldwide. And the other, the, the, the other takeout I would also mention is liquidity. We still need to, to bring liquidity to the market. It, we do need to think very carefully uh, uh, um, uh, on, on the um, the, 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 the quality of, of participating of participants in, 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 our, in our cap and trade systems, as we do need prices and we need, uh, we need, we need liquid prices. Uh, and, and, and for that, the uh, role of the financial authority in this new, young, uh, hopefully um, uh, um, uh, more uh, advanced uh, cap and trade systems uh, are, are, are definitely a key to have them on board and to have them into the conversation. So that all in all, that would be my, my final remarks, Michael. Gracias, Eduardo. Excellent. <laughs> and, and also really an important perspective, I think, for many participants, because one of the audiences that we really try to target with this webinar series is practitioners and other stakeholders in emerging economies that are considering or beginning the process of setting up an ETS. So. Um, seeing how it's happening in Mexico and some of the issues that you faced and are facing has been really, really useful. So now we're finally in the Q&A part. Um, I just heard from Jan Erik, who's managing um, the behind the scenes, sort of the machinations of Zoom, that upvoting questions in the Q&A was not possible until now, Stephanie um, kindly pointed that out and he's been able to fix that. So you can also see what others have asked now in the Q&A. And if you think any question is of particular importance or interest to you, please feel free to vote upvote. Again, a reminder, you can ask questions in the Q&A by writing them in there, or you can raise your hand. I will start preferentially with those who have raised their hand because I think that's always sort of a, a more direct um, conversation. And it is Valeria Alcocer. Um, Valeria, we have to, I think Jan Eric can promote you to, um, or allow you to speak. So let's see. Exactly, talking is now permitted. You only have to unmute yourself and then you can ask a question. Please briefly introduce yourself and also who you're directing the question to or all panelists. Let's see, you're still muted, but it should, yes, there we go. Go ahead, Valeria. Hi, hello. Uh, it was a mistake, but also I will, I will go ahead with a question. Uh, I'm Valeria Alcocer, I'm from Mexico. Uh, I'm currently living in, in Berlin. I just finished a master in public policy. Um, and I'm also interested in, in climate topics and energy 
an energy system. Um, currently, I'm interested in um, developing countries and like, for instance, Mexico, which is one of the, the newest um, countries uh, to attempt to introduce uh, ETS system. So my question is, what is your advice to, to these countries that are, that are new in this um, carbon market to, to really succeed in this introduction of carbon pricing or tax uh, directly uh, the carbon, the emission of energy or to re in order to reduce um, emissions? Volunteers from the panelists? I mean, I can start. I would think I mean, most importantly, if you were introduce a cap and trades a system, I would say the cap is very important if you want to do something for good for the environment. So a more stringent cap will help. Um, and when we think about oversight, um, yeah, having the data and having uh, skilled uh, people, staff, looking at the data from the very beginning, I think is also an important part of uh, successful implementing such a cap and trade market. Additional comments? Go ahead, Dino, please. And then Elvajo. Um, yes, just to build on what Regina said, I agree completely. Uh, a cap is always a start for any system. But in order to also uh, derive a cap, it is important to have a very reliable monitoring and reporting system, something that also Regina touched upon in her presentation. Uh, in order for the participants to really trust in the system, it is uh, exactly important that uh, you can justify why the obligation is there. So what do they have to pay for? You know that the ETS is a uh, implementation of the so-called uh, polluter pays principle. So once you, you manage to establish a, a robust system where it is clear who has to pay uh, the price of carbon and why, uh, it is much easier then to also promote the public acceptance of the system. And Eduardo, you wanted to follow on? Yeah, sure, but, but my, I'm going to be very swift. Massive capacity building, massive. You need to take all ICAP courses one and again and, uh, and bring your private sector and your public sector and your academy and your civil society there is nothing we can do without a massive capacity building effort in, in our countries. And as Dino said, start slow, but start and never end and never stop. And step number one, it's MRV, definitely. Perfect. Thank you, Eduardo. And I, anybody who's interested in knowing how to participate in these capacity building activities, in the closing remarks, I'll also mention one upcoming very um, soon um, opportunity for that. So I'm going to the Q&A questions um, that have been put in the written Q&A. And the first one, a bit over an hour ago, that was Regina while you were speaking, was from Stephanie Lahostoya um, at ICAP. And um, it's short, so, but I hope that, that the context is maybe still familiar. Regina, wouldn't the stringency of the cap also be a risk on environmental and linkage aspects? I don't know if it's enough to, or do you need more elaboration? I mean, Yes, of course. I mean, if you link systems and one has a very stringent cap and the other one has a very lax cap, at the end it's one market and you will, you know, get the reductions where they are the cheapest if the market works best. And that might be not in the market uh, where you have the more stringent cap. So I, you know, they, they, there are implications, of course. Um, with I see Stephanie. Stephanie has raised her hand, um, so I think she probably does want to clarify further the rather sparse written question. Stephanie, Jan Eric will um, allow you to speak, and you only have to unmute yourself. Yes, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, okay. Hi, Regina. Um, the 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 question was the in the context of the slide where you list um, in environmental and other risks to the carbon market and the stringency of the cap was not listed there so that was the context that i think was missing and i was um i mean part of my research is on on hot air 
and so to date i we okay i can't say that but most of the ets's do not have hot air do not have um a cap that is less stringent than business as usual emissions but that could be i think an environmental integrity risk were that to occur so that that is the context of the question Okay, thank you for the clarification. I mean, I was looking at the risks where oversight can make a difference. And that's why I picked out the MRV because there is a, you know, a rule for oversight. I think when you talk about hot air and the cap and so on, I think this is something when you are negotiating the linking and so on that needs to be addressed. But I think with the oversight, I was thinking that it's more related to the regulators ensuring that a ton is a ton and there's no underreporting and so on. But you are right. I mean, there is an impact by hot air on the environmental integrity. That's for sure. Perfect. Thank you, Regina and Stephanie. Now, Sarang Murthy had his hand raised earlier, but um, then lowered it, but I prompted, I, I got him to raise it again because he'd also answered or asked a question that you need. Please, Sarang. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Regina, I had a question for you that kind of stemmed from my nascent understanding of the, you know, Canadian compliance market system and, and kind of what is happening there. Um, so I guess just for a little bit of context for, for maybe a few others. So right now, Canada, of course, has a few, uh, you know, provincial marketplaces, but they're also coming out with a federal marketplace very shortly. Um, and something that we kind of understand right now from, uh, you know, certain guidelines is that uh, there is not going to be a floor, uh, a floor price, rather a market driven approach, but there will be a ceiling price that's set at um, the max, the, the max uh, carbon tax that is projected to be $170 by 2030. So my, my question to you is um, looking at what we had seen in, you know, the chart about the California compliance market, where we had seen a pretty uh, kind of consistent price over the last four or five years. Uh, do you think that if there wasn't a floor price, the, the market would have kind of priced carbon slightly higher or at least at an upward trend because that's kind of what we have heard about at least from certain experts in the field thanks Sarang. yeah thanks for the question and um so in california so it's basically the lower price is uh, like the price can't go below that level which is fixed and when you look at the Californian um, situation, what you find out is that there are a lot of overlapping instruments which are actually reducing emissions substantially in California. And that's why the ETS is um, basically over allocated, I would call it. And uh, so the price sticks at the low level. And uh, that's why we haven't seen um, increases there because it basically just follows where where the, the lower price level is but um, they have changed now a bit of the rules and um, there is also a work by Bushnell a paper out there which is quite interesting which states that um, you know there could be a trigger um, if if scarcity becomes um, um, yeah becomes uh, relevant in the system that then the price will go up quite quickly because the marginal abatement cost curve is very steep in, in California. So, um, but right now there have been so many other policies which have been um, yeah, reducing emissions uh, that the price kind of follows what is the, the price floor. Thanks, Thanks uh, Regina. Regina. And Jim Bushnell, you might know him, Sarang, he's at UC Davis. Um, can find his papers online easily. So we're actually technically at the end point, but I will allow a bundle of like one more question essentially. Um, and I think it's for Dino, um, both in the written Q and A. So um, the one that's closer to our topic is, do you think there's any changes to oversight coming from the Fit for 55 package that is being um, presented very soon, a package of proposals to uh, reform and amend uh, the EU ETS and other climate policies to make it fit for the new 2030 target. And there were some questions about credits and whether there will be, again, more 
eligibility of international credits, but that's not really our topic today. So feel free not to go into that unless you, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, okay with doing so. No problem. Uh, when it comes to Fit for 55, as you know, we are now in, in the final stretch, stretch and it is a um, bit difficult to give a specific answer to this question. The Commission is closely following everything that is happening in the market. Um, market oversight is a part uh, of, of uh, the entire system, as I mentioned. Uh, we think that the rules that are in place are very robust. They, as I mentioned, they, they follow the lines for financial markets, which are usually one of the most strict frameworks there are. Um, so let's see, Commission always has the possibility to react. We will see what will come out of um, the, the legislative process. When it comes to the international uh, credits, there, um, as I mentioned, we had a, historically a problem because they were allowed in the system and we had a huge inflow of credits that were not really reliable. Um, and it was a major factor that contributed to the over allocation in the system, which we are still struggling with, with today. Um, the MSR is working very good and uh, we, we, we hope that this surplus will soon be eliminated from the market. But when it comes to international credits, as I say, it is um, something where we would really have to be sure that we are talking about credible units that really bring um, a tangible uh, abatement in, in, in emissions. And uh, we will see, of course, the, the purpose of the ETS is to improve cost efficiency. Uh, larger market always brings more cost efficiency, but uh, not at the cost of environmental integrity. Thanks very much, Dino. I also thank you, Regina has been answering some of the specific questions in the chat. Um, and note also that the slide presentations will be made available on the ICAP slash or ICAP-training.eu website for this webinar series and other related capacity building activities. Jan Erik will put the link in the chat in a moment. And there you can find also the email addresses of our uh, presenters. So I'm, I, I hope you wouldn't mind if there's a very specific question that they contact you directly um, after the webinar. Um, time to, to close and to thank everybody. First of all, of course, our panelists um, and presenters, really great and rich content today. Thanks very much for joining us from late in the afternoon in Europe to early in the morning in um, here in, in, in the new world, so to speak. Um, thanks to the audience for um, participating, also giving us some very good questions. Thanks, Jan Eric, for helping manage the whole process behind the scenes, and to the European Commission and, and to ICAP um, for hosting and, and funding this activity. Quick mention about how this series continues. So we'll have a summer break for August, um, one month that we're not having our regular monthly installment. But in September, we'll resume tentatively 15th of September. The topic there will be kind of what Dino just mentioned. We will then have seen the package of proposals coming out to make the EUTS fit for 55. And we'll have a chance to discuss what it really means and you know how can one change a, a massive ship sort of mid course to make it even more compatible with the growing ambition of EU climate policy. Um, I also want to mention, as I said earlier, when Eduardo was emphasizing the importance of capacity building and the activities of ICAP, one of these is the ICAP Online ETS Academy, which is the first of its kind, um, and it substitutes for what used to be traditionally in-person two-week courses that we've done for a number of years around the world. In this case, this is going to be virtual, given the global situation, from the 16th of August to the 10th of September this year, and it's really a full-fledged program to teach you everything you want to know about how to set up and operate an ETS and it's modular so it can accommodate both beginners and more advanced practitioners and you can pick and choose what you want to learn and the application deadline for this is coming up soon on Monday 12th of July you see the link for uh, the call for applications in the chat okay with that I think uh, we've all done our part um, to talk about and discuss and share information on the topic of oversight of carbon markets. Thanks again, everybody. Stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you again, whether it's in the online academy, in another webinar, or in any other cooperative um, endeavor. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Buenos dias.
Muchas gracias. <ríe> Chao. Bye bye. Bye.